And now there's the question of how do the human, how have the human rights organizations, uh, the human rights organizations are the effective guardians of international law when it comes to what's called the laws of war, human rights law, international humanitarian law. It goes under various names, but they are the effective guardians of how effective and how proper has been the enforcement of these various bodies of law uh, in various war zones. And in the case of Israel-Palestine, the record of these human rights organizations has been not, I would say, not very impressive, uh, but has gone through periods of being very bad. Then there's been improvement. And now we're in the stage of, I think, total, uh, total betrayal of their mandate. Let's just go briefly through the record. I promise you I'll not be tedious and scholarly. I'll try to engage you as an audience because there is a fear among you that this is going to be a long afternoon with a boring professor. And I'll try my best not to lower myself to that occasion. Um, the human rights organizations have, for obvious reasons, been very cautious when it comes to Israel. And for good reasons and bad reasons. The good reasons are there's a sensitivity to a state which defines itself as Jewish and a population that's overwhelmingly Jewish uh, after what the Jews did during, after what the Jews experienced or endured during World War II. So the human rights organizations feel a kind of moral responsibility after the Nazi Holocaust uh, to treat Israel with, let's say, a double standard, but one born of moral responsibility. That's the good side of the picture. The bad side of the picture, unfortunately, I think is the predominant side. And that is, as everybody knows, Jews tend to be liberal. Uh, Jews in the 2008 election, 80% uh, of Jews voted for Barack Obama, uh, which is a much higher percentage than, say, even Hispanics, where it was about 63% voted for Barack Obama. And when you keep in mind that Jews are by far and away the richest, the wealthiest religious ethnic group in the United States, they should be voting, if people, as most people do, vote with their pocketbooks, they should be voting Republican. But overwhelmingly, Jews vote Democratic, and even in the Democratic Party, they tend to be on the uh, liberal end of the spectrum. So Jews tend to be liberal. Jews also tend to give a lot of money to various kinds of ch charities, philanthropies, and educational type institutions. Uh, you will see that Jews very prominently featured in any university, whether it's the names of buildings, whether it's the plaques. Sometimes it feels as if it's all Jewish. Uh, and same thing with hospitals. Uh, and it's also true of human rights organizations. Jews also tend to be very predominant in the legal field and in uh, professional fields in general, which means Jews will be very prominent in human rights organizations. They'll be prominent in two respects. Number one, in the giving donor respect, uh, and number two, in the pr professional, um, uh, in the professional leadership respect. Well, when you add up all those factors, it's not going to come as a shock to anybody who does the, so to speak, moral arithmetic that uh, these human rights organizations are going to be tilting towards Israel because of financial reasons and because of the sentiments, the feelings of those who staff 
especially in the upper reaches, uh, who staff these organizations. You take a case like Human Rights Watch, which all of you know. The head of it is Kenneth Roth, who is Jewish. I think he describes himself as the child of Holocaust survivors. I can't now recall. And then if you take their biggest uh, donor, uh, by far it's George Soros, who gave them recently $100 million. Not so recently, about five years ago. Gave them about $100 million. Uh, and he too is Jewish. And so for all of those reasons, the human rights organizations, whether it's Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, they tend to have been very cautious towards Israel. So even, the, even as, to take one obvious example, from the moment Israel began the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza in 1967, it was practicing torture uh, against the Palestinian detainees. We're talking about literally from day one. Uh, the human rights organizations steered clear of that. Uh, Amnesty International just wouldn't use, refused to use the T word, the torture word, when it came to Palestinian detainees. That changed quite dramatically in 1987 with the inception of the first Intifada, when Israel's torture of Palestinian detainees reached epidemic levels and it became impossible any longer to ignore. Uh, Human Rights Watch estimated that tens of thousands, I'm using their, uh, I'm quoting them, tens of thousands of Palestinian detainees were tortured during the first Intifada and they make the point that when you given, given the universe from which these detainees were being tortured, which is basically young men between the ages of 14, of, I think they said 14, it could be 16, but 14 and 29, it meant that virtually uh, every Palestinian youth uh, had been tortured during the first Intifada. I lived there off and on during that period, and it was very rare that you met a young Palestinian fellow who hadn't been at some point detained by the Israelis, and which meant at some point uh, he was a uh, victim to the Israeli torture. At that point, the human rights organizations, they began to publish uh, reports in which they acknowledged that, and I'm using their language, Israel was uh, systematically and methodically uh, torturing and ill-treating Palestinian detainees. However, uh, even then, even after that, the record was still kind of mixed. Uh, so let's take a case uh, of 2006 when Israel went to war with South Lebanon, went, went into war with Lebanon, uh, principally the Hezbollah, the party of God, and it lasted 34 days. What, uh, Syed Nasrallah um, called the divine victory. Uh, I know today is a holy day and we're in a holy venue. Uh, still, I cannot say with any kind of certainty whether there was divine intervention uh, during that war. Uh, but what one, what one can say with certainty is Israel suffered a major military setback. Uh, whether you want to call it a defeat or not uh, is less important, I think, than the fact that it was a major setback for Israel. And they were very, and still are, very cognizant of the uh, setback they suffered. Now, the war had already been over. The United Nations Security Council passed a resolution and we, the, the only thing that remained was for it to be implemented on the ground. And Israel at that moment, the last 72 hours, when the war was already over, the last 72 hours, the war was already over, Israel then dropped up to 4.6 million 4.6 million cluster munitions on South Lebanon. It was the densest use of cluster munitions in the modern world. 
And it was, if you read the descriptions, and Human Rights Watch put out a quite uh, evocative as well as factually compelling report entitled Flooding South Lebanon. Uh, when you read it, it read almost as if out of a science fiction movie. It describes these villages, the homes in villages, just saturated the roofs, the ceilings, the walls, the floors, saturated with these cluster munitions, 4.6 million. So what does Human Rights Watch conclude? Well, here is an important point to bear in mind. Human rights supports tend to be divided into two parts. The first part is the factual description, what happened. And the human rights supports tend to be very accurate. They have high professional standards and a high standard of, so to speak, personal and professional integrity, which is to say, rarely, it's happened, but rarely will a human rights report outright lie about what happened. Uh, it happens, but it's very rare. So the factual descriptions of the human rights reports tend to be quite reliable. But then there's a second half of the human rights reports. That's the legal conclusions. What do you conclude legally? So here is the fact set, and then here they have to decide, was that a violation of international law? Was that a war crime? Was it a crime against humanity? And those are legal judgments as against factual description. And as you can see from my physical representation, between the factual representation and the legal judgment, there is a gap. And that gap is where the lawyers step in. And as everybody in this room knows, where lawyers step in, the truth flies out. Uh, are there any lawyers in the room who are offended by that? Too bad. <laughs> and so the Human Rights Watch provides a very vivid, compelling, and horrifying description of what happened, the factual side, but then you get to its legal conclusion. And the legal conclusion is, in some locations, Israel possibly committed a war crime. In some locations, possibly. But then you turn back to the legal, the, excuse me, the factual description. They say that the cluster munitions used an indiscriminate delivery system. That means it couldn't target a site. It just dropped them everywhere. Secondly, they said the cluster munitions blanketed entire towns and villages. Thirdly, they said, they dropped them on places where there were no military targets. So, let's quote from the report. The staggering number of cluster munitions rained on South Lebanon puts into doubt the claim by the Israel that its attacks were aimed at specific targets. We found scanned evidence that would demonstrate a military objective. They quote a senior UN official as saying he had, quote, no doubt that Israel deliberately hit built up areas. These cluster bombs were dropped in the middle of villages. They quote an Israeli commander, what we did was insane and monstrous. They quote the UN humanitarian coordinator. What Israel did was outrageous. They quote the UN emergency coordinator. What Israel did was completely immoral. Then 
HRW itself says what Israel did was shocking and unprecedented. So you ask yourself, insane and monstrous, outrageous, completely immoral, shocking and unprecedented. But then when it comes to the legal conclusion, only in some locations Israel possibly committed a war crime. The, uh, there have been several uh, moments where public perception in the West of the Israel-Palestine conflict underwent dramatic change, or you could say Israel suffered dramatic uh, public relations debacles. The first was 1982, Israel's invasion of Lebanon. That's when I first got involved, and I suspect there are people in this room who are also, so to speak, veterans of the uh, Israeli invasion, which incidentally was much worse than anything Israel committed afterwards. It's often forgotten, but that 1982 invasion, Israel killed between 15 and 20,000 Palestinian and Lebanese, overwhelmingly civilians. Now, for all the horrors that have been visited on Gaza, they don't even remotely approach what was done to Lebanon in June through September 1982. The second major shift in public opinion came in 1987 with the first Intifada, the overwhelmingly nonviolent mass civil resistance, which Israel used uh, brutal repression to, in an attempt to suppress it, uh, in the West, uh, uh, in the Western uh, uh, zones, uh, Israel's brutal repression against this overwhelmingly nonviolent civil resistance, in in large part undertaken by children, uh, again caused Israel no uh, no end of. Uh, uh, anxiety and indignation because its public relations image was shattered. And then the third major turning point comes in um, uh, December 2008 uh, to January 2009, December 26, 2008 to January 17, 2009, Operation Cast Lead, what um, Amnesty International called the 22 days of death and destruction. Uh, that evoked a kind of horrified reaction from the international community because as much as Israel tried to dis disguise it and as well healed as its propaganda uh, machinery is and as com competent and efficient as Israeli disinformation and misinformation is, it was very hard to, to conceal the fact that an, a, a wholly, almost wholly defenseless civilian population had become the object of attack by one of the most high-tech killing machines in the world. And at the end of Operation Cast Lead, about 300 human rights reports were issued mostly or overwhelmingly, actually probably entirely, in condemnation of what Israel had done during Operation Cast Lead. The human rights organizations, in general, their performance was better than in the past, but again, always the fear, the fear of telling the facts fully as they are or I should say, the fear of drawing the legal conclusions exactly as they are. And here you'll permit me, and I hope I won't evoke any yawns, um, uh, just a small digression about how uh, the laws of war work. Under the laws of war, there are basically three categories of war crimes. Two cat they'll all be familiar to you just by the words uh, one category is called disproportionate force. 
And disproportionate force means basically there is, say, a Hamas, as it's called there, a Hamas terrorist. Israel has targeted him, but in order to quote unquote take him out, we'll take this guy hypothetically in the second row, in order to, so to speak, take him out, uh, Israel drops a one ton bomb and ends up killing everybody in the middle section. And along come human rights organizations and they say that's disproportionate force because he is not a valuable enough target that it would justify killing so many civilians in order to take him out. That's called disproportionate force. And then there's another category called indiscriminate force. And that means, say, they target, I'm looking for somebody else with a beard because that's the giveaway. Uh, they target the gentleman in the middle of the middle section. Uh, and they say he's a Hamas militant. And uh, they want to, quote unquote, take him out. But in order to take him out, they fire high uh, explosive artillery shells from a distance which again end up killing everybody in the middle section. I'm sorry that you've suffered two deaths in, in three minutes. And that's called indiscriminate force and that too is illegal under international law. Now there's a third category which although technically equal under international law is different. That category is when you are targeting civilians. It's called a violation of the principle of distinction because the basic principle of international law when it comes to the laws of war, you have to distinguish between civilians and combatants. Civilian objects, say a hospital, and an air base, which is a military object. So that's when there's no military target. You're targeting <laughs> civilians. Even though under international law, each crime is equal to the other, as everybody in this room knows, uh, the court of public opinion is much more uh, condemnatory of targeting civilians than disproportionate force and indiscriminate force. Because most people think, well, it's war. Maybe they didn't know that all these other civilians would be killed if they targeted you. Or they didn't know that when they fired those indiscriminate artillery shells that all these other people would be killed. So most people are willing to give a pass to indiscriminate attacks and disproportionate attacks. What the public, the public won't tolerate or the public won't accept, or the court of public opinion won't tolerate and won't accept, is when a power is targeting civilians. Remember, with disproportionate force and indiscriminate force, the presumption is they were targeting a militant, but killed civilians even as they targeted a militant. But when it comes to uh, the third category, you're targeting civilians. And that public opinion generally will not accept. That goes under a category we all know. It's called terrorism. You're targeting civilians in order to achieve a political objective. That's the dictionary definition or the legal dic uh, dictionary definition of terrorism. So, uh, the human rights organizations were very careful not to use that category, the third rail, so to speak, accusing Israel of targeting civilians. So let's take an example. Uh, Israel, human Rights Watch puts out a report called Precisely Wrong. It's about Israel's use of drone technology during Operation Cast Lead. Uh, the drones have very powerful cameras, very high resolution, and uh, very impressive technology in general. So the operator, he or she can see from a high altitude not only the color of your blouse or your shirt, uh, 
uh, the operator can also make out the pattern on your blouse. It's a very impressive piece of technology. The second point to bear in mind is when the operator fires the drone missile, the missile itself has cameras and the cameras have the same high resolution technology. Now, what does that mean in essence? In essence, it means the drone operator fires a missile and up until the very last minute, when the missile is, so to speak, up against the forehead of the target, um, the drone operator can divert the missile. He, it's usually a he, he has the capacity to divert the missile up until the last second. So HRW describes Israel's use of drone technology during Operation Cast Lead, and it says, for example, as follows. On January 4th, 2009, an IDF drone launched a missile at two boys playing on the rooftop. Israeli statements and media reports indicate there was no fighting in the area at that time. Given the optical capacity of the drones, the young age of the boys should have been apparent to the operator. Well, that's the factual description. What's the legal the conclusion of Human Rights Watch? It concludes that Israel violated international humanitarian law. They didn't say it was a war crime. They didn't say it was effectively targeting children for murder. But they said it's a violation. Now, violations in international law are like violations in domestic law. So everybody knows a violation if you urinate in public you have committed a violation. So in the case at hand, it says if a driver deliberately ran down two children playing in the street and he's found guilty of violating the speed limit. That was the maximum Human Rights Watch was willing to say. In the record of the Human Rights Reports, there was one major, uh, uh, one, one outstanding difference. And that was the case of the Goldstone Report. After Operation Cast Lead, the United Nations Human Rights Council appointed the respected South African jurist, Richard Goldstone, to investigate what happened. So Goldstone was a respected jurist, had a unimpeachable record, reputation. Secondly, Richard Goldstone, by his own reckoning, was a proud Jew. He was not Jewish by fortune, he was Jewish by self-identity. He was a proud, and is, a proud Jew, or so he described himself. And thirdly, by self-identity, he was and is a proud Zionist. He sat on the board of directors of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. His daughter did Aliyah, uh, which means that she emigrated to Israel for ideological, nationalistic reasons. And so here comes along Richard Goldstone and he issues a report which was very exhaustive, it was the most exhaustive of all the human rights reports, but it was not only exhaustive, it was also the most damning it in its conclusions. Mr. Goldstone crossed what you might call his own or international law's moral Rubicon because he said, well, let me quote him. He said, Operation Cast Lead was designed to punish, humiliate, and terrorize a civilian population. To punish, humiliate, and terrorize a civilian population. Now, what makes that statement so remarkable 
it was the first time a human right, a respected mainstream human rights organization, so to speak, lifted a corner of the curtain that was camouflaging what Israel was up to in Gaza. These were not disproportionate attacks. These were not indiscriminate attacks. Because if they were disproportionate or indiscriminate, it had to assume they were targeting military objects. They were excessive if they were disproportionate. They were excessive if they were indiscriminate. But still, it was targeting military objects. Not so, says Richard Goldstone. They weren't targeting military objects. They weren't targeting terrorists. They weren't targeting command and control centers. They were targeting a civilian population. They were trying to terrorize a civilian population into submission. They were, in effect, engaging in state terrorism, and they were guilty of not disproportionate attacks, not indiscriminate attacks. They were guilty of crimes against humanity. Well, as you can imagine, as most of you know, uh, Israel was not pleased with that conclusion. Goldstone, as he issued the report, I suppose he was pr pretty confident that to use the language of Star Trek, my generation Star Trek, he had three formidable deflector shields. The fact that he had an unimpeachable professional reputation, the fact that he was Jewish, the fact that he was Zionist, he probably felt that he was impervious to any Israeli assault. But now it turned on that the Klingons, or in this case the Israelis, <laughs> They were equipped with their own photon torpedoes, <laughs> and rapidly the deflector shields started to collapse. Goldstone came under a very vicious, brutal, relentless, and ruthless assault by Israel and its supporters. His past as a judge during the apartheid era in South Africa was dredged up at one point. Uh, Israel supporters tried to block him from attending his grandson's bar mitzvah. Uh, and um, the assault continued without let up for a sustained period of time. And then just about, not just about, exactly seven years ago this coming week, no, seven years ago tomorrow, uh, People opened up their newspapers, the Washington Post, and on the op-ed page, Richard Goldstone recanted the report. He took it back. And uh, it was a kind of crushing moment, at least for those who had invested a lot of faith and hope that these human rights organizations would act as some sort of impediment to Israel's uh, brutality and ruthlessness, uh, but it wasn't to be. Richard Goldstone claimed, he alleged, that he retracted the report because he said new information had become available, which caused him to reconsider the conclusions he reached in his original report. Uh, without going through it now, and for those of you who are interested, I go through those allegations or rationales of Richard Goldstone in the book I wrote, and I think it's quite clear that there was no new information that became available. Uh, there, that was simply flatly untrue. And that left two possibilities why he retracted. One possibility is he retracted because of that public smear campaign, that uh, witch hunt that was unleashed against him. Uh, that is a possibility. I'm not convinced by it, uh, again, for reasons which I can't now go into. Uh, my own guess is that uh, Goldstone was blackmailed. Uh, 
Uh, everybody's got skeletons in their closet, and if you happen to be one of those rare souls who has a uh, has a um, an inter a personal record as pure as uh, as snow, freshly plowed snow, uh, but then you always have a relative, a sibling, a child, who doesn't have as pure a record, and then you become susceptible, one person removed, to blackmail. And I think based on the evidence, which I go through fairly carefully in the book, uh, the reasonable speculation is that Goldstone was blackmailed into submission. Um, but it's not so important. What's important for our purposes is what happened afterwards. Uh, and what happened afterwards is the human rights organizations completely collapsed. Uh, after Operation Cast led, there were about 300 human rights reports. Uh, but then after Operation Protective Edge, which was much worse quantitatively than Operation Cast led, if you just take the basic numbers, 6,300 homes were destroyed during Operation Cast led, 18,000 were destroyed during Protective Edge. 350 children were killed during Operation Cast Lead. Um, 550 children during Operation Protective Edge. Uh, if you look at the basic numbers, uh, the um, Operation Protective Edge was quantitatively much worse. But in fact, only about a, a 10 human rights reports were issued on Operation uh, Protective Edge. Human Rights Watch wrote one skimpy, totally forgettable report. Uh, and the only human rights organization that weighed in significantly was uh, Amnesty International. Uh, but Amnesty International was a complete disaster. Um, 